Welcome to the Decent People Podcast, a production of Decentral Media, where we're committed to telling the stories of the founders, builders, and visionaries who are creating a new decentralized economy and internet experience. You guys know it as Web3 or blockchain, and we're going to bring you the smartest and most interesting people in the space for intimate conversations that reveal their background, how they got into crypto in the first place, and what they're doing today to make a decentralized future a reality. Thanks so much for joining us. Make sure to check out our site at Decentral.io. Now, to the show. Hi, and welcome to the latest episode of the Decent People podcast. I'm your host, Matt Leising, and today I am joined by a great guest who has a really interesting backstory, uh, starting in traditional finance uh, and has worked her way all the way up and is now deep into the weeds in crypto. Uh, I'm speaking, of course, of Jill Gunter. Hi, Jill. How are you? Hey, Matt. It's great to see you again. Yeah, it's really great to have you. Thank you for coming on. Um, I wanted to mention at the top here that uh, you used to do a great podcast with Melton Demirs, uh, yes. what, what Grinds My Gears. That's right. Which I loved. And she was the first guest on this podcast. So now oh, I love it. Yeah, now I've, I've, I've hit the double with you guys. And that was a big, uh, big goal for me right off the bat. So thank Gotta you. Gotta catch them all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Melton's great. And you're great. So I'm really happy to have this chance to talk to you. Yeah, well, thanks for having been a listener. I can attest of all of the challenges and work that go into making a podcast great. Um, and uh, yeah, kudos to you for for taking that on. Meltem and I only lasted about 18 months at it, but it yeah. was fun while it lasted. Strangely enough, somebody said to me the other day, like the vast majority of podcasts don't make it past 10 episodes. And I'm like, wow, thanks for telling me that. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's more work than people think. <laughs> yeah, it is for sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think this is like number 14 or something. So I think we're good. Congratulations. Um, yeah, thank you. Awesome. So uh, as I mentioned, you you began your career at Goldman Sachs and, and we'll get into that. But I, I'm curious about um, where you grew up and, and what uh, your early life was like. Yeah, for sure. So uh, I grew up in the Boston area primarily um, from the age of, I guess, six years old or so onwards. Uh, lived in Boston, the Boston suburbs, moved around kind of a lot as my family got settled in that in that area. Um, one thing that I feel like has been very informative is that uh, I grew up in a house where both of my parents were working on, or in my mom's case, had worked on Wall Street uh, for a number of years. And so it was a house where, you know, sort of Bloomberg and CNBC were always on the TV. Um, you know, the FT was always on the kitchen table. And uh, I feel like that was very informative uh, for me, just uh, having kind of an interest in uh, finance and kind of the the movements of uh, the world and geopolitics and how they impacted financial markets and all of that from a pretty early age. Um, yeah, so it was Fed rate hikes were a big conversation topic around the dinner table. <laughs> They could be, indeed. <laughs> indeed. Yeah. Less relevant in the early 90s, I guess, than they have been yeah. over the last few years here. So um, did you take to it or like, did you take a liking to finance or like, did your parents make it interesting to you or, or from an early age? They certainly did. You know, I think that uh, as a little girl, you know, knowing that my mom had had this, you know, big Wall Street job in the 80s and then seeing my dad, uh, you know, work very directly in the markets and, um, you know, him travel for work and all of these things that appeared very glamorous to me, at least at the time. I think I think that they were very glamorous. But now when I have to travel for work, I'm like, man, this is hard. This is hard work. This is yeah. not this is not all that I thought that it would be. Um, but, you know, I think that there is always this kind of like fascination around it for me. Um, what did your mom do? My mom, uh, so my mom worked as an options quant at a couple of different Wall Street firms, wow. uh, which is pretty hardcore. Um, she uh, she actually had studied linguistics in university and and for a master's degree. Um, and as part of her linguistics course, she learned Fortran and and some of those earlier kind of programming languages. Um, and that translated very directly uh, onto Wall Street for her in the positions that she then held there. Is she one of the few people who still knows how, how to program in COBOL? <laughs> she may be. Yeah. She may be. I think that Fortran was more her jam than than COBOL. But she's certainly one of these people who, um, 
you know, it, she, she does pretty well in navigating, you know, her MacBook and her iPad and all of that. But if you pull up the command line interface, that's when she gets really excited. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, awesome. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. that's, a, that's great to have such a role model in your house um, yeah. for you. And then what did your dad do? Uh, so my dad uh, was a trader for a very long time on Wall Street on what's called the sell side at the big banks. Um, and then he became a money manager at Fidelity. Um, and that was the the position that he held for yeah most of my sort of childhood teenage yes. years. Cool. Yeah. Were you into um, like sports or other things as you were growing up or uh, into science or kind of like a nerd or how would you characterize yourself back then? Yeah, I was I was pretty nerdy, I would say. Um, uh, yeah, uh, probably goody two shoes kind of nerd uh, stereotype. Um, I, I sports did end up playing a pretty big role in my life, but uh, hilariously enough, it was basically as a result of perpetually being the last kid picked for the dodgeball team that I ended up getting into the sport that I got into, which I can tell you about. Um, you can't see this perhaps on the podcast, but I am like five foot two. I am, I've always been pretty diminutive. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, that did not predispose me to uh, being you know, picked for any of the varsity teams or, or ever being, uh, you know, one of the, the top in my year at really anything, whether it was the running tests or we had to do this terrible, uh, kind of presidential fitness test, I oh, yeah. think it was called every year. Yeah, I, I um, have a certificate. Uh, Ronald Reagan is on the signature there. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how you did at it, Matt, but that was always like one of the worst days of school for me. <laughs> But um, long story short, so I grew up in Boston and in Boston, you have the Charles River right there running through it. And, uh, you know, I would see the rowing teams go by the college teams, high school teams, what have you. And um, it was my brother, actually, I have an older brother who kind of led the way for me on this front. He was also always pretty small for for his age as a kid. and. Uh, he kind of noticed oh hey there are these like tiny people on these big rowing teams that steer the boat and get to yell at the rowers and get to be kind of like you know the bossy ones in command of the crew like that looks like a great way to fulfill a high school sports requirement <laughs> um and so i ended up taking that up i became a coxswain is what that position is called on the rowing team um and yeah very genuinely i initially took it up in order to fulfill uh the requirement to do a sport at my high school um but i ended up sticking with it all through college division one varsity i ended up being um the captain of my college team which is yeah just kind of a hilarious like, turn of events and evolution of things for that's awesome and were you kid. actually rowing by that point or were you always the coxswain no i was always the coxswain yeah okay. sadly i never i never grew into the the actual rowing role um and I would, I would imagine getting out there i know it's a really it's a sport that you do really early in the morning because you don't want you know there to be any wind but i would imagine that must have been really nice and peaceful for a lot of mornings for you know for a college student you're not really appreciating like the peace and the beauty of it. All you know is that you're out there at 6 a.m. when all of your other friends are still at home sleeping in for another three to four hours. Um, and so that was that was definitely a key challenge of it. But no, in all seriousness, I mean, to me, I think the thing that stands out the most from that sports experience was just the camaraderie. Um, it, rowing, I think, as with so many sports, can be kind of like a little cult unto itself, um, where sort of everyone almost globally at a certain point, but certainly like within uh, the college ecosystem, like you all kind of know each other, you know, your competitors, you know, you all commiserate with each other after losses or hardships. Um, and in a way, I'm not even trying to bring this back to crypto necessarily here, but I feel like it's worth mentioning. In a way, it really reminds me actually of the crypto community and the crypto world, mm -hmm. where, you know, it's it is this sort of uh 
little um, community, or at least it started out in crypto, you know, back several years ago when you and I were first kind of in it as a very sort of intimate small community where everyone kind of knew each other. Um, and, you know, even your fiercest competitors, there was a level of sort of uh, understanding and, and camaraderie uh, between the two of you. And I think that that's something that I've always kind of gravitated towards is having uh, perhaps in some ways a niche, but uh, a tightly knit um, community around. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that um, completely because at the end of the day, what everyone in Web3 or crypto is trying to do is, is uh, create an alternative to what's out there already. So while there might be infighting amongst the people, at the end of the day, it's like everybody's on the same team in that way, you know, Absolutely. trying to do something new. Absolutely. Yeah. Were you at Harvard around the time when um, Cameron and Tyler Winklevoss were, were also crewing or was that, do you, I was, did you ever talk to them about this or? I was a little younger than them. You know, I don't think I've actually ever spoken to them about rowing itself, um, but I did in many ways sort of like follow in their footsteps between Harvard rowing. And then I uh, did a master's degree at Oxford, which they also did again, a few years above me. Um, and then of course, like, you know, coming down the crypto rabbit hole and I have to give them a lot of credit. I reached out to them back in 2015 when I was first looking to move into crypto in a full-time way. Um, and I just sent them a cold email out of the blue, like, hey, you know, context, like I also was on the rowing team at Harvard but a few years below you, you know, now I'm looking to move into crypto. And they gave me so much time. They spent like hours with me. I remember, I think that they were in a car, like driving somewhere and just had me on speakerphone. And it must've been That's a awesome. long drive yeah. because they spent like 90 minutes on me, with me on the phone. Um, just sort of like giving me the lay of the land. This of course, again, was 2015. Like, it's funny to think how sort of nascent everything was then, but, you know, pointing me in all the right directions, like yeah. good startups to talk to for, you know, potential jobs and gigs in the space and introduced me to just a ton of people in their network. I give them again, so much credit for me ending up uh in the space period but yeah. certainly kind of the journey that i've taken they've always been really generous with me too um i've known them over the years and it's it's rare to get like if, if listeners don't know cameron and tyler winkerboss obviously a facebook fame but then they got into bitcoin super early and created gemini which is one of the um bigger us exchanges yes. so yeah they've just been like evangelists out there for for a long time um, and so they're also tw like six foot five twins, so they're hard yeah. to miss. I suspect yeah. many of your listeners may be yeah. familiar. Yeah. yeah, they were definitely rowing the boat. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, for sure. <laughs> um, so in high school, when like when did did you start thinking like because obviously you had this financial sort of like milieu you were in with your mom and dad. Yeah. Was that sort of like always the way you saw yourself going, or what were you like in high school, and, and kind of what direction were you headed in that at that point? Yeah, you know, I, I had kind of a whole range of interests um, from like an academic or career perspective, I would say kind of all the way through. Um, I was uh, super deep down the rabbit hole on things like math and chemistry uh, in high school and thought thought for a second that that might be what I ended up majoring in in college. And then equally, I would say I was really interested in, you know, sort of current affairs, government, you know, international relations, that kind of thing. Um, and so I always kind of had these two tandem interests or two sides of me. Uh, very candidly, when I got to Harvard, um, which is where I did my undergrad, I very quickly found that um, there were certain classes that it really felt like you were getting your money's worth on the tuition in terms of uh, the engagement that you got from professors directly. And these, of course, are intro courses that I'm talking about. You know, this is kind of the first year type of thing. Uh, and then there were also classes where it really felt like the big impersonal intro course that is sort of stereotypically at a lot of these colleges, you know, taught by grad students mainly, um, and where you're kind of just out on your own, you know, you're going to spend a lot of time just learning from your peers through office hours and so forth. And unfortunately, 
uh, fortunately or unfortunately, because obviously life has worked out the way that it has and it's been, it's been great so far. Uh, but my experience of a lot of like the math and science courses that I took in that first year were like the big impersonal courses. And then meanwhile, um, you know, I started taking like government and history courses and so forth, which just, I think by the nature of them, uh, were much more sort of hands-on intimate experiences with these absolutely incredible, you know, world leading professors in their fields. And so that's what I ended up gravitating towards. Um, and, uh, so yeah, I ended up studying combination of, of history and government. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember that dynamic. I went to UC Santa Barbara um, and I was, um, I wasn't pre-med until later in my like years, but I remember the, the Bio 101 class had 800 students in it. You know, it was in like the biggest hall that the, that the campus yeah. had and yeah. it was just crazy. It was like, um, you, could, you know, you, the, the, the professor's like this big on the stage. Exactly, you know? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, did you have any fun and or terrible jobs in high school or college? Yeah, so I um I became convinced actually you'll get a kick out of this in college that I wanted to become a journalist. Okay. Um and uh I <laughs> I would say these were more in the fun category than terrible, but I did a series of gigs and internships um, that were uh, gravitating towards the field of journalism. And um, yeah, I mean, some of them, some of them were amazing experiences. I got to work on. Like, what like, did you like to write about or what were you like interested in? Or did you have a choice or was it just like you were just do doing what you were told kind of as an intern? Uh, more the latter for sure <laughs> like I was not sort of you know getting bylines on things or or actually doing writing you know a lot of it was just sort of like conducting background research and and um compiling things and to a degree also you know getting coffee and <laughs> and that sort of thing um but you know I felt super lucky to have been able to to have all of those experiences I think that um you know, more than anything, it was a good uh, wake up call as to the realities really of any job of, you know, all of the, all of the grind that that goes into it. Um, yeah, I've loved it over the years, because it's it's one job. I, and I can't think of too many of these where you're learning something all the time, you know, yeah. every day. And it's, it's, it's really, I love that about it. But I think for your bank account sake, you probably made the right choice. <laughs> Becoming the Wall Street sellout. Yeah, I mean, it, it. it's funny. It Basically, you know, you get to, at least at the time, this was sort of a few years post 2008 and Wall Street was still kind of the primary track or at least one of the primary tracks for anyone who was not a STEM major coming out of these like big liberal arts schools. Um, and I think in a way, you know, that's a huge failing of the system um that it felt very much to me and i think a lot of my peers like okay either you're going to go to wall street and do either trading or investment banking or you're going to go into consulting or maybe you're going to apply to law school and like yeah. it felt like those were very much the three big choices um and yeah i think you know that I, I think and I hope that maybe that's evolved a bit since then. I think well, I was going to say to keep it on crypto kind of in the background. Like, I think that's a real option now for people. And yeah, I'm not even sure like college is necessarily, you know, required anymore. If, if you're really into it and you like want to participate, it's there, you know, for yeah. you. and I think we're still early enough in it where you can learn like through a DAO or you can like, you know, find mentors and things. And I think within a year or two, you could be really up to speed on a lot of this stuff, which is great. Totally. And it's been something that's been really inspiring to me as I've connected with more college students and so forth who are getting into the space that, you know, they are already getting their hands dirty, you know, experimenting with DAOs and, and minting their own NFTs or, you know, in a lot of cases, getting into the code and writing their own smart contracts and so forth. Um, and I think that, you know, college for many can be a really amazing time of having sort of some freedom and flexibility to explore, you know, certainly not for everyone, but for those who can use that time of life in that way, I think having crypto available as something to explore 
is a really, really cool dynamic at the moment. And there's so much about crypto today that reminds me, I mean, it's trite to say, but does remind me of, you know, the early days of the internet from when I was a kid, right? So in kind of the um, mid, late nineties, and I had often thought like how cool it would be or would have been to have been sort of in college at that point and to have been able to, you know, kind of be exploring all of that. Um, and I feel like there are echoes of that now for anyone who's in college with. I was in early. college then and I didn't explore it at all. So. <laughs> well, you came down the crypto rabbit hole really though, Matt. So uh, you're yeah. doing something right. Yeah. But, so you started at Goldman as a trading analyst and then you were a credit trader. Um, about like, is it true like the first couple of years, like at any big investment bank, like tell me about those. Is it, what is it as like crazy challenging and like all the hazing and stuff as you hear stories about? Like, can you just tell me a little bit about what that was like? Yeah, so I, I was there at kind of an interesting turning point, I think for Wall Street and for the financial services industry where I joined again a few years post 2008. And so there were a lot of reforms happening on kind of a cultural level, certainly in terms of cutting away, I think a lot of like the excess and a lot of the nonsense. And I think, you know, as just part of that process of like modernizing and reform, you know, I think a lot of like the hazing and also like perhaps, you know, the entrenched misogyny and whatever else came along with the Wall Street of probably at the 80s, 90s, and even 2000s was um, was starting to get stripped away. And so that was, you know, in many ways, probably perhaps a, a good thing and a good uh, time to join. But on the flip side, I would say that morale across Wall Street, this was not sort of specific to, you know, the desk that I was on or anything, but just across Wall Street, morale was, uh, struggling it had taken a hit you know in terms of just the amount of regulation that was coming down the pipes in terms of the lack of respect that people had for you suddenly just societally if if you were working on wall street and then also in terms of comp having been cut it, this didn't really affect you know the junior kids on the desk so much but certainly for the more senior players um you know who had two mortgages and a house in Connecticut and a house in the Hamptons and a bunch of kids and whatever, you know, I think that that was, uh, you know, that was a challenge from a morale perspective. And so it was kind of this interesting moment in time to join that industry and to kind of capture and, and get to feel both some of like what had been of this old world and to hear, you know, from, your higher ups and more senior traders and managers around you, some of the war stories, but then also to be able to see, well, like, okay, well, the rules of the game have changed and yeah. this is how things are today. It sounds like you would have been paying attention though in 20, uh, 2008, right? Um, oh, for you, sure. Do you remember, like, did you have a sense of like how like catastrophic it was at that, at that age? Yeah. So I was a freshman in college in the fall of 2008 and, um, yeah, I just remember me and a, a few of my kind of, you know, the friends who I I had just made, uh, you know, sitting around watching the news and just watching the charts. And um, you remember that yeah. day, I think it was the TARP bill that got yeah. like it, it didn't pass the Senate or the whatever. It didn't pass Congress and the S&P just fell off a cliff. Yeah, and I was watching the Bloomberg terminal at that moment. Yeah. And it was just something that I never thought I'd see. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I think that at the time, you know, we probably felt quite lucky to have just started college, but I think that for many of us, we could already kind of see and project out like, Ooh, how is this going to impact the job market for us? You know, what is, what is the world going to look like? Um, and I think that, yeah, that was a very kind of informative event of like early adulthood to, witness and feel the impacts of and um and be a part of and i think that certainly kind of following all of that uh gave me a lot of context for the wall street that yeah. i entered into four years later yeah i remember when i wrote my book talking to all the people who created ethereum and the people who are around at that time that was a huge kind of common thread among them was that they all sort of saw 
10 years of their life, like of their financial lives sort of like vaporize, yeah. you know, yeah. and the jobs just disappear and sort of that feeling of being screwed over by things that they have no control over and, and very yeah, disillusioning. Having, yeah, very disillusioning and, and for having such an impact on their own personal life. And yeah, I mean, something that, that I would add to that is just that then being on Wall Street and seeing the attempts at reform to Wall Street just really drove home to me how hard it is to reform a system effectively that is so entrenched and yeah. has, you know, perhaps so many systemic issues and that you know, the processes around which are highly, highly political, right? Um, so very profitable. All of those yeah, things that you wanted to be reforming were some of the bank's money centers, you know? Exactly, indeed. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that that also was then a very disillusioning experience for me of just looking around being like, this is not, this is not the way, this is not working as it should be. Um, and, you know, I, you asked about the experience of being, uh, you know, in your first couple of years on Wall Street, being the junior kid on the desk, as I very much was. And, uh, you know, it all slides downstream <laughs> onto you. Yep. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was certainly true in terms of implementing, for example, a lot of like the regulatory changes and reforms, you know, I found it suddenly uh, on me, not solely on me, of course, but on me, at least in part, to be meeting with the compliance department, to be understanding the implications of, you know, the new rules and regulations around the positions the desk could be taken, taking or around, um, you know, the trading of credit default swaps and short selling and all of this kind of thing. Um, and then I also found myself, you know, a lot of the job is just like, booking trades and, you know, yeah. dealing with back office settlement and making Mindless. sure that, yeah, yeah, making sure that the bonds are where you thought that they would be on the day that you thought that they would be and you've actually made delivery and, and, uh, you know, all of these types of things, which at the time was grueling and brutal because it was high stakes and, you know, moving so quickly and it was really challenging in a lot of those ways. But ultimately, those experience of doing some of these uh, tasks that at the time, you know, I, I wished that I could move through more quickly. And I wished that, you know, I had a Jill who could start <laughs> taking some of them on. They, they became some of the most, uh, I think, kind of influential and formative experiences because I got all of this context on the way that the plumbing of the financial system yeah. actually worked and you know what what was broken there as well and that became a lot of the inspiration around my eventual move into crypto and yeah, that's funny because that's what I was specializing in at Bloomberg was market structure and like what I remember what yeah worked, yeah or what yeah. didn't work and and all the reforms under Dodd-Frank and stuff um which yeah, it really gives you a really interesting perspective. And then you, once you start digging into it, you realize like, oh man, this stuff is really kind of being held together with bubble gum and spit, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And um, it was very much, I had a few sort of very liar's poker moments. If, <laughs> if you and, and your audience are familiar with the Michael Lewis book where, you know, he shows up as, I think it was literally like a 22 year old classics major um, on the desk of Solomon Brothers. And I very much felt that uh, at times where, you know, I would be looking at the way that things were happening, <laughs> you know, just across yeah. the markets and think to myself, oh God, you know, yeah. Do any of us have any business <laughs> doing what we're doing here? Um, and of course, you know, yes, we did. But at the same time, it did highlight to me sort of the degree of um, the degree to which, as you say, things can be held together with bubblegum and spit and, and do rely on sort of just like the trust that exists between uh, third parties and intermediaries and counterparties and so forth. So did you learn about I'm assuming you got into crypto first through Bitcoin and were you uh, at Goldman at that time or, or how did that all work out? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I had heard about Bitcoin, I would say, um, you know, it, towards the end of college, uh, being in a college environment, uh, there were certainly people around who were using Bitcoin in those days. You're probably um, even mining it, right, from your dorm room. 
mining it certainly yeah. and also probably using it to buy things online <laughs> to be honest <laughs> in in yeah. that context at the time uh being kind of the the nerdy goody two shoes that I was and probably still am I was kind of like this seems sketchy I I don't really want to touch this with a 10 foot pole um but then over the course of yeah it was like 2012 into 2013 uh the desk that I was on we were dealing with the Argentine debt crisis that was happening at the time Argentina uh the sovereign country was uh going through yet another default and um a few of the brokers who I worked with essentially colleagues of mine who were down in Argentina started telling me about how they were using uh Bitcoin cryptocurrency to get their money offshore um and it was at that moment that I was kind of like, oh, this is this is pretty interesting. And then, of course, Bitcoin started to take up over the course of uh, 2013 and having gotten into it. Um, then in kind of the early part of that year, I felt like a huge genius because, you know, I'd gone from, I think, like a couple hundred dollars up to a thousand dollars by the end of the year. I bought my mom some Bitcoin. She was really excited about it, actually, because she'd seen uh, Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss on TV on CNBC talking about it. Um, and so, yeah, uh, she and I, she and I jumped in with both feet, which is kind of a fun mother daughter thing to do. Yeah, that's great. I've done I did the same for my mom a couple of years ago, and, and she looks at her wallet every day and, and really looks forward to it. So what I love is that I'll chat with my mom about it and you know I guess this would have been a few years ago but she'll say things to me like now I have this bitcoin cash thing in my wallet as well like what am I supposed to be doing with that you know is that is this is this the same thing I'll uh, you know kind of explain to her like oh there's this thing called a fork and you know yeah. you've ended up with this bitcoin cash and um you know, she'll just have the these kind of hilarious reactions that I think would be very resonant with the Bitcoin maxi community where she'll be like, OK, now how do I just sell that to get more Bitcoin? <laughs> I'll be like, <laughs> um, you would fit right in yeah. on crypto Twitter. Yeah, yeah. She should go on Peter McCormack's uh, podcast. Oh, my gosh, that would be phenomenal. <clears throat> I would love for him to do a mom series. That would be great. <laughs> that would be great. So did you, um, now you're sort of like getting into it, you're understanding the sort of like maybe the blockchain aspect of it, the digital ledger. Was there like an aha moment while you were still at Goldman where you're like, I need to kind of jump into this? Or did you go down the rabbit hole at some point and, and realize that like, I, I want to kind of change the trajectory of my career? So, yeah, I mean, I think that, I, I really think that there is a lesson here in the, a little story that I'm about to tell you that it's often at the times where you feel sort of like the most unmoored and lost in your life that you find something really new and that really resonates with you and kind of like your calling and your mission. And so I at some point knew that I wanted to leave Wall Street. Um, I, I loved like the content of what I was doing. Like I still loved the markets and I still loved um, you know, the nature of trading, which, as you said, I think like journalism, you know, you're learning new things day to day and no two days are ever the same. You know, I loved a lot of that, but um, it just became clear to me that Wall Street was not going to be kind of my my long term calling, at least in the way that that I was uh, embedded in at the time. And so I uh, what a lot of my friends at the time <laughs> called, I pulled the grad school ripcord mm -hmm. and started <laughs> started uh, applying to to grad school programs as I mentioned earlier um I guess in the footsteps of Cambridge. That's how you landed at Oxford. I ended up at Oxford. Yeah. I now at the time I had applied to study basically um political economics and, and international finance and I applied with this very sort of like vanilla research topic in mind um kind of straight down the fairway of that academic field um doing stuff related to to what I'd been working on at Goldman in the context of Argentina and the debt crisis and so forth. Um, and, you know, I, I thought like, maybe I'll stay on, I applied to a master's program. I thought, you know, maybe I'll end up staying on to a PhD. Maybe I'll get this master's degree and like move back to, you know, New York and live happily ever after in Greenwich, Connecticut, working at some macro hedge fund, you know, on the economic side of things. Um, 
you know, we'll see. But I, I felt, to be honest, like pretty lost about where this all was gonna gonna go. Um, and it was during that period I took a few months off before I started uh, the grad school program. Um, and I spent those few months honestly just going really deep down the crypto rabbit hole, uh, spending a ton of time on like the early Bitcoin talk forum, um, reading about this new idea that was suddenly out there that people were talking about called Ethereum. Yeah. Um, I still have, I think, the email for uh, like the first ever DevCon uh, <laughs> invitation. Yeah. Um, the somewhere in, in the depths. Yeah, exactly. Somewhere yeah. in the depths of of my emails, um, like Ethereum, I really did not understand at the time, but I was like, this sounds cool. And this sounds like it would deliver on, you know, a lot of the promises of, of Bitcoin sort of more broadly. But again, it was really during that period before I even arrived at grad school that I started spending a lot of time on this and really fell in love with the space. And by the time I got to grad school, I basically went into my supervisor the first day that I was there. And I was like, I know I applied to do my research on this other just like kind of mainstream like finance and economics thing. But like, you know, have you heard about Bitcoin? Like, I really think this is going to be a big thing. Like, I'd really love to study like the kind of political economic implications of it in the context of this program. And bless him i mean i think that he was just like probably who is this like american woman who's showing up here talking about bitcoin this was early 2015 it was you know very much kind of the the lows of the bitcoin cycle at that point no one was talking about it nobody cared uh and you know he he kind of let me run with it um and i ended up doing a whole bunch of research on basically how Bitcoin could be used to, could be, but perhaps wouldn't be, um, was kind of the upshot of it, used to evade capital controls and taxes and interestingly sanctions, which has become very a relevant. very hot topic du jour. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was very kind of exploratory research as, as my uh, supervisor at the time kept pointing out to me, there was, no literature and like very little data. Um, I remember calling up uh, Chainalysis at the time and trying to convince me to let them use uh, their their tools and their data um, for free, which uh, did not <laughs> did not end up going over. Yeah. Um, they had a business to run, of course, but uh, it was a cool experience though to um, you know have that as an excuse and. Yeah. A, a passageway awesome. uh, down the yeah. rabbit hole. It reminds me. So I, yeah, I was doing market structure stuff and, and knew how Wall Street, you know, the markets worked and didn't work. And then I finally wrapped my head around like the blockchain and what it could do um, for for that like kind of back end stuff for for like financial markets. So I went to my editor and said, "Hey, I want to add blockchain to my beat." He's like, "Cool. What's blockchain?" <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that was 2015. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, I know. It's funny to think back on that. Yeah, yeah. It's only seven years ago, but yeah. Um, well, I, I was, uh, I did not remember this about you, but you then you went to work for Chain. Yeah. Uh, which is Adam Ludwin's, I don't know if he was a founder or co-founder, but yeah, Adam, founder, yeah. Adam, for anyone who's listening, he's, he's one of the greatest people in crypto in, in all that I've ever met. He's, he's one of the smartest people and he's he's also just Got this really great ability to explain things uh, in very, very plain, clear thinker. very plain English, yeah. and he yeah. helped me an immense amount um, when I was like learning the ropes and stuff. Um, so, what was that like? Uh, that must have been. That, I think that would have been a great place to kind of jump in on all this. Absolutely. So, I while I was in grad school, I think starting from pretty much the time that I showed up there, I just made it my mission to get a job in this industry somewhere mm -hmm. after yeah. this. Um, and of course, at the time, there were like a dozen companies total, I think that, you know, yeah. were kind of established and working in crypto. Web3 was definitely not even a thing that people we didn't, were talking yeah, about. We didn't even have that term back then. Yeah. And just for any of your listeners out there who are trying to break into the industry now, I feel compelled to share that 
I applied to jobs for like nine months. I did everything I could to like network, to apply to every, you know, apply cold to every job posting that I could find. I was applying to things that I had no business applying to just to try and like get my, you know, resume through the door, whatever. And it was not until like, I was basically on the verge of finishing up the master's program that I was in that I finally got a job. And uh, it was actually through Dan Robinson, who you may know, some of your listeners may know is now uh, an investor and research lead at Paradigm Capital, um, the venture fund. But um, it was just the randomest thing where I saw, I think it popped up on Facebook of all things in my Facebook feed that Dan Robinson had just started a job at Chain. And I was connected to him through college, through university. And I just like had not spoken to him in probably seven years. And I just DM'd him and was like, you're into this blockchain crypto stuff too. Like we should talk. Like I, you know, I've been getting super into it. And uh, we hopped on the uh, on the phone. He was like, oh, I think we're hiring like a biz dev like strategy person. Like you should, you should chat with, um, our founder, Adam. And uh, yeah, kind of the rest was history. And Chain was in a really interesting place because they had just pivoted away from having been working on Bitcoin developer tools. Um, they'd been around since kind of the early, early days of like 2013, 2014. Um, and they had pivoted to a more enterprise focused strategy, which was right up my street, given kind of the Wall Street background. Um, and I think more than anything, what I would say was that Chain was just a really incredible place and environment to like learn about so many different sides of the industry from like, you know, the use cases out there and, and doing a lot of exploration yeah, on yeah. that as we tried to, you know, pivot around and find product market fit, um, to learning about the technology, like just so many amazing people who've also gone on to do amazing things uh across the industry. Um there who were just such i mean as adam is like really incredibly clear thinkers and and clear teachers for someone like me who did not have a computer science background since i abandoned uh you know math and science after my first my first bad experiences um and it's interesting that you started there with what you're doing at espresso because like enterprise blockchain refers to a private network where everyone on that network knows who the other um, participants are. So that's the opposite of Bitcoin or Ethereum, where everything's basically pseudonymous and you don't know who you're interacting with. But for Wall Street and for finance and a lot of other like business type applications, you can't take that risk. Like you need to know who you're dealing with. So, right. And so, is, yeah, definitely on the forefront of like trying to. Uh, I, I know they were, you guys were working with Visa and you had a couple other really big clients. Yeah, uh, uh, NASDAQ. And, yeah, yeah, right. So uh, yeah, really, really interesting. And I always thought in the back of my mind, I'm like, I bet the first like really breakout thing is gonna come through enterprise blockchain. So somebody's gonna figure out something that's just gonna like make everybody like really turn their head. But it, I don't think that really ever happened. Well, I think that there were a lot of great lessons out of it and just for listeners context. So um, yeah, Chain had a whole bunch of really incredible enterprise partnerships and relationships. And, um, you know, we put a lot of uh, projects into pilots and and even into production um, with some of these partners uh, for these more kind of like private um, or permissioned blockchains uh, that, that we were building the software for. Um, and then Chain ultimately ended up uh, finding a great partner in the form of Stellar, the cryptocurrency protocol, um, and uh, the two companies merged. Um, and uh, the rest is kind of history and now operates, I think, under Interstellar still. Um, but I think that there were a lot of really great lessons to those of us who were building for enterprise at Chain. One was that it's just the sort of sales and and uh, cycles for getting tech into production when the tech is so emergent and the companies that you're working with are so well established yeah. and entrenched 
uh, can be very challenging and huge shout out and credit to, um, you know, a lot of the people at these bigger companies and these big firms who really championed these things and, and pushed them along in the face of what I can only imagine was, you know, a lot of internal pushback or skepticism. I don't know that, but, uh, you know, I can kind of imagine. Um, but I think also, you know, a big, big takeaway, at least for me, was that a lot of the value prop of blockchains and of cryptocurrency and whatever the applications of them are does come down to these things being open decentralized systems mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean that they're inappropriate for enterprise in fact i think that one of the next big waves into crypto will be more enterprise focused whether that's wall street institutions starting to use DeFi products uh, more actively whether that's big businesses starting to use products like USDC for paying payroll cross border um, or paying suppliers cross border and so on and so forth. Um, but as you say, you know, the needs of enterprise, I think don't preclude use of open blockchain systems, but they are highly specific and in many ways, highly differentiated from what a retail user could get comfortable with. And I think that one of the big ways in which that's true is in terms of their relationship with data and privacy and so forth, where on the one hand, they need to know their counterparty, they need to know their customer in a way that if you're a retail DeFi user, you might care a bit less about. But on the other hand as well, big businesses and enterprises are way more sensitive about their own data than again, I might be if I'm just flipping NFTs. Um, and so there was one insight out of that that very much informs what I'm now working on building with Espresso Systems um, of just the importance of being able to have a flexible approach to privacy that was neither purely the, you know, open, yes, pseudonymous, but let's be honest, you know, most things on the Bitcoin and Ethereum blockchains can be de-anonymized by those who really care to do so. Uh, you know, that on the one hand, um, basically a fully transparent system. And then on the other hand, something like Monero, which is basically fully private, you know, you need to be able to uh, give users in particular when those users are enterprises, the ability to fine tune what's private and what's not about what they're doing. Yeah. And I think it's it's interesting to to look at a, like a predecessor to Espresso, I, I guess would be something like Quorum that was came out yeah. of JP Morgan. It was basically an Ethereum system that had then a second node on top of it that like completely you know um just made everything private so that they could you know like not be leaking customer information because that's just something you can't do on wall street it's just like completely verboten um yeah so yeah to to clarify so espresso is a fully open permissionless layer one blockchain um by design that's what we're building and that's what we'll be shipping uh, testnet for here in the next few months. Um, and, you know, our, our approach here is not just to target enterprises, although to the extent that that enterprises end up using them as they become kind of a next wave of entrance and users into the space, that's great. And that's exciting. Um, but really to empower developers to build on, again, an open permissionless blockchain, but one that meets users' needs around privacy and data integrity and all of these things in a way that, um, you know, hasn't hasn't been possible before. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm, I'm thinking back to uh, the work that, yeah, JP Morgan Quorum did around privacy. And I think that you're very right to, to draw that parallel, because as I recall, there was an element of being able to kind of selectively share you know what uh what data uh you needed to within that system and i think it was also zk uh zero knowledge based which is um you know the technology that that we're using here but yeah just it's funny there are two different ways of talking about private blockchains there are those that are privacy oriented in terms of their functionality and then there are those that are like private and permission and closed gardens yeah we're public yet privacy oriented uh, blockchain. Yeah, and it's interesting. I've, I've, I've noticed this privacy discussion coming up more and more recently. Uh, I, I think for a, a long time, it wasn't really part of the discussion. Yeah. Uh, it was just, you kind of had to take it uh, at face value that if someone, you know, because 
all blockchain transactions are public and you can see them. So if some if somehow you are linked to an address, then I can see everything you've ever done. And that's that's the issue. But people, I don't know that, I mean, there, there have been other um, you know, ways of, of dealing with this, but I, I think it's now people are starting to think about it even more. Um, and I'm wondering if you think uh, things like what China's doing with the digital yuan and, and talking about other central bank digital currencies or like a digital US dollar, the, you know, that would have to be issued on a blockchain of some sort and it would make, you know, tracking possible for like everything you ever spend your money on, which is something that nobody wants. But the um, other effects of a digital U.S. dollar on this ecosystem, I think, would be fantastic. So, I, do you, is that is there some tension there? Do you think that that's where um, some of this discussion about privacy and why it's coming up now? All right. Yeah. No. I think that I think that a lot of the discussion around you know surveillance state around uh, you know the the data usage and custody uh, issues, perhaps of Web 2, you know, dating all the way back to a few years ago with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. I think certainly, you know, what China is doing with their own digital currency um, and now even conversations again in the U.S., as you allude to, about a CBDC. I think that all of these things are kind of contributing to a zeitgeist where this is more and more top of mind for people in terms of uh, their data and, and the privacy guarantees around it. I think, though, also that uh, crypto and Web3 is just getting to a point of maturity where people suddenly care to look at each other's wallets and to see what they've done, what they're doing. People have kind of the knowledge uh, at a more kind of mass scale and more mainstream level of, oh, hey, if, if Matt sends me some USDC to pay me back for coffee, I can go in his wallet and see yeah. all the trades he's done and, you know, some some degree of his his net worth that he holds in cryptocurrency and all of these types of things that, again, just as people get educated about and have the tools to do and as people realize how much they're exposing, I think that it really comes down to that, that people have started to care about yeah, this. I, I, that's a great point. I mean, it's amazing if you watch like crypto Twitter when something bad happens, like the, the this week, the Ronin Bridge was exactly. you know, like, you've got like, I don't know how many, 20, 50 people, all of us, like within minutes, sort of like, I'm going to tell you what just happened. <laughs> and they're, and they're doing it in real time. You can yeah. see the exit of liquidity yeah. in real yeah, time. Yeah, it's amazing. And I love, I love seeing that. And I hate it as a reporter because it's like, <laughs> Everybody's just going straight to, you know, straight out in the public. Yeah. And like, I'm just like, that's been one thing in my career. We still like, need the interpreters, Matt, though, for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Sure. But it's like getting but, a scoop in this business uh, in crypto is just really hard because people <laughs> people just like to go out to their Twitter feed or whatever um, and just kind of say it to the world. No, um, absolutely. So without getting too much into the weeds, like, so what you're like, Espresso, um, it's, you're using zero knowledge proofs to kind of like ratchet up or dial down the level of privacy that you want. Is that kind of an easy way of saying it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So where we've started is with a product that we call CAPE, which stands for Configurable Asset Privacy uh, on Ethereum. At first, it will eventually be on Espresso, uh, the layer one that we're building that's kind of uh, fit for purpose for this. Um, but, you know, the, the very kind of simple MVP version of this uh, that, that we're launching on Ethereum. Uh, we open sourced the contracts a few weeks ago and uh, we'll be standing it up on the Ethereum quarterly testnet in a few weeks time. Um, what it enables uh, users to do is to firstly issue assets or create templates to wrap existing assets uh, over from Ethereum and imbue them with the privacy properties that are appropriate uh, to that set of users or to the use case that they want to enable. And so, you know, one easy example of this is if you're a stablecoin issuer uh, with a stablecoin that exists on Ethereum, and you might be seeing demand from your users to have a more private version of this, um, but those users are perhaps comfortable with you as this already kind of trusted third party that's issued the stablecoin, maintaining some insights into what's going on on the ledger, who owns what, what the amounts are that are moving back and forth. Um, you could create sort of a wrapper template, if you will, within the CAPE smart contract, enable users, again, to wrap your stablecoin over 
and have the privacy guarantees that you want to offer them while still maintaining on your side as the issuer you know that all of the data integrity that that you would need to have for your reporting requirements or whatever else it is um and so it replicates you know in that example there are many different permutations of this of course but it replicates in a way the privacy guarantees of the legacy financial system which some people might look at and say well what's even the point but it's important to remember that the privacy guarantees of the legacy financial system are already better than the privacy guarantees of what goes on on Ethereum today. Um, and so we want to very kind of pragmatically move the space in that direction to be able to fine tune who can see what, under what circumstances, you can imagine all kinds of ways of getting more creative with that. Yeah, and it goes back to what we were saying earlier about the crypto community wanting to create an alternative you know, to the traditional financial system, but that doesn't mean they want all of their transactions to be known. You know, they don't, exactly. they, they don't want to be like, they, in fact, I if think, you go back to the kind of the cypherpunk origins of the space, you know, a, a lot of it was premised and Satoshi actually even says in the white paper, you know, in the legacy financial system, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, you know, people achieve privacy through relying on trusted third parties that's not viable here. And so we must have another solution. And his solution at the time is pseudonymity. But as we've found out uh, time and time again, it's not, that's not really robust in the yeah. face of the analytics tools that have developed. Yeah. And it can also be used, you know, by authoritarian states to make the, their populations even more under their control. So Absolutely. that's, that's completely against the ethos of what all of these folks in web three are doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, that's right. And it's, yeah, it's scary. You were talking about like Argentina defaulting on its debt. Like I've, I've recently learned that Russia has been working with Venezuela for years to create, because Venezuela has been under US sanctions for, for a long yeah. time. And Russia is helping them create an alternative system where some crypto is involved and other things are happening. And so it's like, there are, you know, countries actively working on like using these tools that everybody's coming up with to, to, to sort of evade things and, and like, kind of do evil stuff so it's and this is i mean this is kind of a thread that has run throughout my time in crypto is you know i first got into it through studying uh the possible use of crypto in evading capital controls and sanctions um i worked on a project called the open money initiative for a number of years looking at venezuela specifically in large part but other countries as well in terms of how crypto is being used both by populations there as a lifeline, um, but also in instances, you know, by the government and government officials uh, in order to hedge against the currency that they themselves are, are inflating away to nothing. Um, and it's something that, you know, I often think about now and in, in the work that we're doing with Espresso Systems is just this question of, you know, how, how are people going to use this? Um, you know, if you create the tool, you don't get to choose sort of who uses it for what. And a big part of the ethos that we have around what we're building is to just empower people with greater optionality and greater controls. Um, where again, you know, the, the state of the world as it comes to privacy in blockchains does not need to be just black or white all transparent or, um, or not, uh, you know, it can be this thing that is controlled and fine tuned according to the use case and according to the need. And I think that that is the best way to get, uh, to get at, you know, the right outcomes, um, in terms of both protecting people and finding the right balance there. And I think uh, it would also, it would help spread adoption where there are corporations or, you know, financial, um, institutions who, have varying needs for privacy and and but don't have those you know really good tools for it now and so with this coming out it might um, help kind of get some legacy players you know to kind of take that that leap. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that that's right. I think that that's right. That's the hope. Yeah, that's great, um, Jill. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. Uh, it's always um, really great to catch up. Uh, I think what you guys are doing at Espresso sounds really interesting. I'll put more information about um, you guys uh, in, the, in the liner notes. So make sure to check that out if you're interested and um, good luck with everything. And thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much. Yeah, excited to share more soon.
Yeah, I, I wanted to get into like macroeconomic stuff because there's so many crazy things happening right now that let's we'll do, do that. I mean, yeah, there's a yeah. lot to cover there. There's sure. a lot to cover there. And I know um, you, you've got it covered. So <laughs> <laughs> All right. anyway, Thank you, thanks so much, Matt.